Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 133 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. My guest today is Justin Ling. Justin is an award-winning investigative journalist whose work has appeared in Vice, McLean's, Foreign Policy, and The Globe and Mail, among other publications. He's also the author of the book Missing from the Village, about Toronto-based serial killer Bruce MacArthur, and has hosted two seasons of the Uncover podcast for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I invited Justin onto the podcast to discuss a story he wrote in April 2021 titled The Rise and Fall of a Double Agent. It's the story of Cameron Ortiz, a senior member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who was arrested after a classified document was found in the possession of a businessman providing encrypted phones to criminal organizations worldwide. But before we continue, I've got something special to share with all of you, something I believe you're going to find as fascinating as I do. It's the whale hunting newsletter from investigative journalists Tom Wright and Bradley Hope. If you're a longtime listener to the podcast, you might remember Bradley, who was my guest for episode 87. I think I have a good grasp of what piques your interest, and I can tell you that whale hunting will take you on a deep dive into the worlds of money and power that you just can't find anywhere else. Uncovering the infamous 1MDB scandal, the world's biggest financial fraud, was like a red pill moment for Tom and Bradley. It revealed to them how the world really worked, and how the strings of power are pulled by elusive figures. So they started writing whale hunting about the world's richest and most dangerous individuals, often unknown to the public. You can also follow the new whale hunting podcast where Bradley and Tom share what's got them talking each week from headlines to underworld gossip, as well as interviews with reporters, spies, investigators, and the occasional criminal. It's not to be missed. I'm a subscriber myself, and trust me, whale hunting will change the way you see the world. But don't just take my word for it. Head over to whalehunting.projectbrazen.com to sign up. And to listen to the podcast, just search for whale hunting in your favorite podcast app. Justin, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Of course, I don't get too many chances to tell recent stories from the world of espionage since, you know, most of them <laughs> remain classified for so many years, of course. So I'm really glad for the chance to talk to you today about this case. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a fascinating case and we, you don't often get the chance to see, <laughs> I guess, how the sausage gets made and how it gets stolen in the same in the same instance. <laughs> Absolutely right. Exactly right. So uh, I have to ask you, first off, I know that from looking at your other work, you're very kind of selective about the stories that you write about. So what was it that led you to this one in particular? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, you know, a, a big part of how I pick stories, you know, is the sort of convoluted test that goes on in my brain. Are other people covering it? Are other people missing some aspect of this? Is there an angle on this story that no one else seems to appreciate? And in this story in particular, it had gotten a fair bit of coverage here in Canada. It had gotten a fair bit of international coverage, given the Five Eyes implication. But it struck me that there was so little done in terms of trying to figure out why and how, right? There's plenty of coverage about what had happened. It's not a lot trying to devise how somebody had risen to the upper echelons of the Canadian intelligence service, right? You know, despite Canada's you know, very staunch status as a middle power, it remains one of the most influential security apparatuses in the world, given its position in the Five Eyes. How he managed mm -hmm. to rise so high and exploit that position with seemingly very little intent or purpose behind it, right? You know, there was no clear ideological driver. There was no clear financial motive. There was no clear personal vendetta. You know, trying to unravel that mystery struck me as a very interesting enterprise. And, you know, over the course of about a year, it definitely was. And it was one of those mysteries. I can understand why my colleagues didn't get very far, because it was a mystery that was incredibly hard to try and piece together. 
And we're only now getting the full picture because he's been uh, tried and convicted. And some of this information has finally been allowed to uh, enter the public domain. Right, right. Exactly. So first of all, that's exactly why I started this podcast as well for these the same reasons, you know, because I really want to get to the why and then the how, but mostly the why, honestly, for a lot of these stories. And you're, you're right, because I have found so often that I'll see a headline about something and I often don't talk about um, breaking news stories related to espionage. You know, there'll, there'll be a high profile arrest. But beyond that, hardly anything mm-hmm. else is initially reported because so much is kind of locked down behind you know, classification and all that. So I have to wait for trials in many cases just like you and a lot of other journalists have to as well before evidence is submitted and been declassified and that kind of thing to really get some insight. So it's, it's endlessly fascinating. And one thing that I really enjoyed about your article was because you don't write so often about espionage, you gave kind of an amazing, like a, like a primer really for your readers about the, the various motivations, including ideology, like you just mm-hmm. mentioned a minute ago and gave some terrific examples of, you know, people that have been led by money or ideology or what have you. So I was really glad to see that being introduced to a, a readership that might not be as kind of immersed in that world as I am and as, as my listeners are. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I, I intersect with intelligence every once in a while. It's not my primary beat, um, but I do a lot of you know general national security stuff, um, it's particularly um, when our security services, both the U.S. and Canada and elsewhere, um, are trying to deal with the topic of homegrown extremism, right? I'm fascinated with that problem. So, you know, I'm familiar enough with the with the industry, with the business, as it were. But yeah, I, I what also you know irks me is that a lot of journalists and writers who handle the issue of intelligence and national security often seem like they're writing for each other. And I get it. I I can get wonky as well. But, you know, demystifying some of this stuff for the broader public, I think is always a worthwhile exercise because I'm also somebody who comes into this world with a heavy dose of skepticism, right? You know, I think intelligence and national security policing are foundational to society. It's, you know, how we keep ourselves in line, keep ourselves safe. But it's also, you know, a, a, a part of our state that gets so easily prone to abuse and to overstepping just by virtue of how secretive and esoteric it is, right? So I think demystifying it has this really great utility of making it sort of accessible to the public and therefore increasing accountability on it, right? So the more you can sort of peel back the curtain a bit and show people how it works and how human it all is, right? How it really is made up of a relatively small number of people who have their own sort of predilections and problems and demons and weird inclinations. The more you can show people that I think the more people kind of go, oh, okay, I'm starting to understand why things can go so wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's a very closed off society in so many ways, and that can lead to some unexpected and completely inappropriate outcomes sometimes because you're right, people do get to the point where they don't really feel like or they literally don't answer to anyone but themselves, mm-hmm. and then the shackles are off. And some really, really bad consequences have come from that many, many times across many different nations and eras. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's the flip side, too, which is that great investigative work led by uh, good analysis and good intelligence can do a lot of good. And I mean, this is the case. This is this case also shows the flip side of that, how, you know, good old fashioned police work coupled with a, a pretty kind of quickly evolving understanding of how criminals, terrorists and spies, you know, enemy spies <coughs> use technology is what enabled them to catch Cameron Ortis and also Vincent Ramos, the guy who ran this, this encrypted BlackBerry service for organized crime the world over. Also how money laundering works. You know, the, the fact that we had good investigators who, who were able to untangle all of this is also a good sign of how this stuff works properly with the right supports, with the right constraints strains and with the right oversight. Mm-hmm. No question. No question. So let's go back to the company that kind of led to this whole thing unraveling. The company's called Phantom Secure. And before I read your article, I had heard of them somewhere, but I hadn't looked too closely. So that really opened my eyes quite a bit to what was going on there, just as it did the investigators when they kind of latched on. So can you talk about what Phantom Secure was and how it kind of proliferated over the years? Yeah. So, I mean, they're really, they were not the first to do this. 
I don't even think they were the best at doing this, and they've certainly not been the last to do this, but I think they may have been one of the biggest and one of the most successful, and that's for a couple of reasons. But basically, Phantom Secure at its very core is a hardware software company, right? They bought up consumer-grade BlackBerry phones in bulk. They managed to completely wipe and reinstall their own software onto these platforms. And the Phantom Secure software was basically a, a pretty rudimentary smartphone OS with a bunch of hardened encryption standards on top of it, right? So the keys for these phones were held somewhere in the world. I, don't, I still don't think we actually know where they were being held at the time. <coughs> but were held somewhere in the world by the executives of this, of this company. These phones could only communicate with other Phantom Secure devices. They were not otherwise connected to the World Wide Web. They were mm. not interlinked with the, the general phone network. They had multiple layers of encryption. And then maybe, I think probably the most useful piece of tech on these systems was that they also had a kill switch that could be activated at any time by Phantom Secure. And you can actually see records obtained by the FBI of frantic text messages going to Phantom Secure headquarters saying, you know, one of our guys has been pinched, can you wipe his phone? And sure enough, oftentimes when cops would get their hands, or, you know, would arrest a drug trafficker, would, would stop someone at the border, they'd grab this BlackBerry sitting in the center console and turn it on only to find that it was just basically bricked. And that's what made them so hard to catch for so long. They had this sort of automatic booby trap that meant as soon as someone got uh, picked up, the company would would make the phone inaccessible. And it was only through some kind of clever, kind of actually old school policing that they managed to finally get around that. But fundamentally, Phantom Secure was a was a communications platform for criminals by criminals. And that's also what I think made them somewhat unique, right? This was not a company that sort of pretended like it didn't know what its customers were doing. In fact, Vincent Ramos and, and other people in his outfit were charged themselves with trafficking drugs around the world. Mm. Um, and there was very much an ethos of, you know, we're criminals, you're criminals, we know what we're doing here. And oftentimes the drug trafficking and, and I think some of the racketeering was sort of baked in to this technology company, which I think helped improve trust with their customers, helped them find new customers, kind of diversified their income in a way. So they're a really fascinating company and, and many uh, members who made it up are still on the run and will probably never actually be hmm. caught. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. So did Vincent then, did he start the company fully intent on, you know, selling these to criminal organizations or was there some more the other like non-nefarious organization that might buy these? Was he going to try to sell them to government agencies as well or, or what? No, I think at this point it was pretty clear what the company was. And there had been other companies doing really similar work in the years prior to him opening up Phantom Secure. And as I understand it, Vincent Ramos had, a, had, his, had his toes in the water of organized crime and drug trafficking pretty early on. He recognized a need in the market. And I think when one of the previous encrypted phone services went dark, he saw an opening in the market. Mm. And he was really effective at finding clients. I mean, you know, in some of the indictments, they go through his clientele and it ranges from kind of a two-bit organized crime operation in Reno, I believe it was, somewhere in the American Southwest. He kind of had his own criminal outfit on the Pacific Coast. Coast and in California, we think that Mexican cartels were probably using them. He had some of his business located in Southeast Asia, where I, th I believe some of organized crime in that part of the world was also using phantom secure phones. You know, I think one estimate put put the number of devices out there at some some twenty thousand. You oh, know, this wow. was a pretty big operation, and he was feeling a huge demand in a market for encrypted platforms wow, that would okay. allow. You know, individuals in criminal enterprises to communicate with each other undetected and, and protected from law enforcement. And he was really effective. Like I, I can't stress enough how many investigations these phones popped up in where cops knew they would be thwarted 
right out of the gate. It, it wasn't until they figured out that dropping these phones in a Faraday pouch would finally protect them from this kill switch and give cops uh, an opening to actually start exfiltrating data from these phones and building a case against a lot of these folks. And it's really interesting that that really uh, investigators, the FBI, the RCMP, and some others, the Australian police were involved at one point. They started building a case against Phantom Secure before they started going after their clients because they needed Ramos to flip and provide the, basically the keys to the castle, the full access to the servers mm. and the networks that help them access a lot of the, the device level information. I see. So without his cooperation, they would be like drastically hindered in taking down the sexual network then, I take it. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. And, and you know, <laughs> I can tell you that in the midst of this investigation, and particularly after it, law enforcement and intelligence services got really interested in how to short circuit the successor to Phantom Secure. I think it's been reported a handful of times here and there, but law enforcement in the US and Canada, and I think some European agencies have done the same thing, they've been looking to set up their own encrypted device businesses in order to create a honeypot for those clientele who were abandoned mm -hmm. after Phantom Secure went under. And I, I believe, I mean, talking to some folks in the intelligence world, um, I believe they actually used some of the technology they seized from Phantom Secure to help build the next generation of this police controlled black phone systems, oh, which gosh. I think is a really interesting and actually quite ingenious tactic on, on the part of the cops. Oh man. Yeah, I hope that that story one day comes out. That would be incredible as well, <laughs> starting up right from the beginning as a law enforcement entity rather than Ramos, the organized criminal. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. I, I was I was just trying to picture a moment ago when he's in that phase one, trying to build his client list and, and spread word and that sort of thing, like those sales pitches were to the most dangerous and most cautious organizations and potential clients in the world. So how were those going? You know, was it him himself going out there with a bunch of phones in the trunk of his vehicle? Or did he hire salespeople or something like that and be like, try to get in contact with the cartel? You know, it's hard to imagine. Well, I, I know I know that in some cases, there was an element of compromise that went on, right? Before you could be fully entered into the Phantom Secure family, you may have had to move, you know, a kilo of coke across the border or something oh, along wow. those lines, right? Oh so you had to prove yourself one of the guys to some <laughs> degree before you could kind of be entered into the family. I, right. I don't know if they, they made that a prerequisite in every case, but I know that in some cases, they did exactly that. And it's a great way to prove, I mean, you know, it does it doesn't necessarily preclude that an undercover cop is going to be one of the ones accessing these phones. And I believe there mm -hmm. was at least one case where an undercover cop did manage to get a phantom secure device. But it's it's a pretty good way of of testing to see if your prospective clients are serious or not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely is. That's amazing. So I'm curious, were these priced like ten times higher than a normal phone and a normal phone plan and that sort of thing? For him to yeah, move twenty thousand, the huge element of risk there, of course. Yeah, I mean, you're not you're not just paying for the hardware and the software, right? The hardware is really just consumer grade, grade BlackBerry, which at the time was going for a few hundred, you know, five hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. The software, which is actually, you know, all things considered, not not worth all that much. You're really paying for the customer service, right? You're paying for the fact that there is going to be a customer service line you can call and get them to activate the kill switch whenever you need it. Yeah, you know, yeah. That is the utility of Phantom Secure. So the phones ran about $2,000 a handset, I believe, for about six months. That was some of the language that was put in some of the indictment material. And I, there used to be a Phantom Secure website. And this go, shows you the degree to which they were not really hiding what they were doing. They actually had a, a full website you could contact. I mean, you, you, they never answered their kind of public facing email, as far as I understand it. But they did have a website to kind of make themselves look quasi legit. And I, I, I think some of their general pricing may have been there at the time. So suffice to say, you know, probably somewhere in the span of four to $5,000 a year is probably a pretty good guess. Four or 5,000. Okay, yeah. 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 So it's, it's, okay. You're not wildly expensive, all things considered, much more than a regular cell phone plan, but maybe not as much as you expect from a, a pretty secretive organized crime enterprise. But I think the idea was you get in touch with the Mexican cartel and they're not just going to buy one or two phones, they're going to buy 200. And I mean, the fact that they were able to move about 20,000 of these devices, or at least kind of 20,000 clients, I think was the language they use, shows that they were pretty effective in terms of marketing. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, for the, for the right client, and there wouldn't be many people that fit that profile, but for them, it would be worth maybe 10 times that cost. 
on an annual basis. You know, wiping that phone can keep half the organization out of prison, potentially. Yeah, and that's exactly it. I mean, you know, there are definitely criminals and spies out there who are satisfied with an iPhone, right? Knowing that the FBI probably can't do a full intercept and decryption in transit, but you, you can kind of never, and, and, and maybe they won't be able to access it even if they seize the device. But I, I think there's plenty of instances where that just is not good enough, where police have managed to find a, you know, a backdoor a zero day or whatever, and mm-hmm. get access to those, to those handsets. So I think the, the, the sort of the, the, the comfort provided by Phantom Secure is, is worth its weight in gold. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how long was he able to run before he truly became like a focus of a, of a serious international investigation? Yeah, I mean, Vincent Ramos, the whole thing fell apart around 2017. I think he started the business around 2011, 2012. So he didn't okay. have it going that long. All things, maybe even a little bit later. I'm struggling to recall the exact founding date of a fan of Secure. But, it, you know, all things considered, it actually had a huge impact considering it was only around for a handful of years. Mm-hmm. And it became weirdly ubiquitous awfully quickly. Okay. Incredible. So, Justin, how exactly did they wind up arresting him? Like, how did they figure? Was it difficult to figure out who the CEO was once they had decided that the company was the target? No, I mean, I think everyone knew that Vincent Ramos was the head of Phantom Secure. I'm not sure they knew to the extent to which some of his co conspirators mm-hmm. were involved with the business, but I, you know, his name was on the, the registration documents for the company. I think he was relatively public facing. Of course, he was kind of selling the idea that they were sort of. You know, a perfectly reputable company had no idea what was going on. <laughs> right. It was that approach of of managing to grab one of the phones. So there was actually it was a border stop in Washington State. A guy was driving an SUV into Canada, and I, I, it's still not clear to me if they had a tip off about this car or if the border agents just smelled something fishy and just had a really good instinct. But they start searching the car and find a hidden compartment, and inside is tens of thousands of dollars worth of MDMA. And really quickly, and this is why I think it probably was a tip off, they grab the guy's phone and they drop into a Faraday pouch really quickly. Mm-hmm. The guy, I think the, the guy they arrest, the guy, the driver's name, I think was Wheels. I think was his, was his code <laughs> name, which I, I, I'm always fond. Some of the code names that came up in the story were really genuinely fun. So they, they drop into a Faraday pouch and they get it out of there real quickly. So I, I can only imagine that Ramos is sitting at his computer hitting the kill switch button and, and seeing it's not working and is just absolutely panicking. Mm-hmm. And they managed to get it to a lab and, and actually managed to export some of the data on that phone. And it, it starts to dominoes tumbling. You know, they'd also had an officer who had managed to, I think, access the one of the organized crime groups that was using Phantom Secure phones. And between those two things, and I think a handful of other things, they managed to piece everything together. They managed to understand the degree to which Phantom Secure was not just a neutral platform, but in fact was... A, a, a conscious party to the organized crime going on on its network. And it was that that they used to file the arrest warrant, the indictment uh, for Vince Ramos. And they arrested him actually not far from that border crossing where his one of those mules was arrested. He turned state's witness pretty quick. I think he knew he knew he was, had him dead to rights. He ended up handing over access to those servers. I think, I believe the FBI actually ran the Phantom Secure server for a little longer, even after they had access to it, to try and collect as much data as humanly possible. Uh, But he enabled a huge amount of access to his former customers' information. So you have to imagine that he probably had that that day in his mind for quite some time, knowing that he'd eventually get caught. But his downfall was was pretty massive. And it, it did kind of lead to a significant number, you know, I don't think we know fully how many organized crime groups across the US, Canada, Mexico and elsewhere were busted, thanks to that, that arrest. But I, I think it's probably a pretty significant quantity. Okay, okay, fantastic. Did he wind up with just a reduced sentence? Or is he like in witness protection now or something like that? No, I mean, he, he, whoa, I, I, he was convicted. I think he did sign a plea arrangement. He's not witness protection to the best of my knowledge, okay. but I think he's still serving a pretty significant sentence. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. He is, he's in a bad position then if he, you know, testified or assisted against some of the most significant organized yeah. crime organization in the world. So yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah. He's probably sweating every day. I would imagine. Yeah. 
So all of this really, like we haven't even mentioned Cameron Ortis yet, even though he's kind of the subject of the story. So how did this guy of all people play into this phantom secure story? Like what happened with him? So it, it was, you know, I, I kind of put myself in the shoes of the FBI investigators who are just starting the process of going through what was on uh, Vincent Ramos's laptop. And as they're going through, you know, just sifting through, I can only imagine the Excel spreadsheets of all the clients and you know, many of whom Ramos didn't even know their names, you know, going through, I'm sure a lot of the financial documentation, they stumble upon this PDF of a document from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And it is a memo about Vincent Ramos. It is a it's classified, it's not super clear to me if it was secret or top secret, but it was a classified document that detailed the investigation, the joint investigation between the RCMP and the FBI. It detailed, uh, I think, some of the plan to take him down. It detailed the, the business he was running. And it, you know, suffice it to say, it's not a document that Vince Ramo should have had. The mm -hmm. fact that he had access to this memo just blew everyone's minds immediately. So naturally, the FBI get on the horn to the RCMP and say, hey, listen, you have a mole. You must have a mole somewhere. There's no conceivable explanation for why this document would be in the possession of a target of a joint invest, you know, RCMP FBI investigation. It's no reason even to have this document unless someone handed it to him. And so the RCMP go into a frenzy. You know, immediately there's a witch hunt that goes on, you know, a mole hunt, I guess, that goes on internally at the RCMP to try to figure out who conceivably could have given this to him. The number of people who, had, who would have had access to this document is pretty small. And within, I, I, I think it was relatively quickly, I think it was a matter of weeks, they start honing in on Cameron Ortis. Here's a guy who, who does not fit the model of, of either a cop or an intelligence official for that matter. He's an academic by training, never been a cop, never trained to be a spy. You know, his expertise was on the use, coincidentally enough, or, or appropriately enough, the use of the internet by transnational organized crime, <laughs> particularly in Southeast Asia and East Asia. But he, his interest kind of went, went a little bit further. He's a guy who was, you know, wore thick glasses, kind of kind of a little bit schlubby, didn't cut the figure of a spy any way, sh way, shape, or form. He sort of slid into the RCMP as a strategic consultant in the mid-2000s, ended up rising through the ranks surprisingly quickly, specifically because he gained the trust of the commissioner of the RCMP, the top cop of the country. And before long, he was literally running the intelligence service inside the RCMP. So that means he is one of the best situated people in the world to the most exclusive intelligence sharing partnerships, the one led by the US or, you know, dominated by the US, <coughs> but made up of US, mm -hmm. Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. You know, he is sitting there with access to the top secret server that contains a lot of the memos shared by the Five Eyes countries. You know, when they started honing in on him, I can only imagine it was just an unbelievable shock. I mean, maybe one of the most compromising security leaks in the history of the Five Eyes. There's not been many more. There's been a couple. But there's not been many more instances of somebody with this level of access basically mm -hmm. being exposed as a, as a spy, as a double agent, as a mole. And so when they realized it was him, they moved relatively quickly to make the arrest. I think before they even really 100% had the case finalized, they had him off the job and in handcuffs. Again, I don't think people realize the extent to which this was an enormous scandal when it happened. But I think people in charge, and I'm sure the FBI, and I'm sure everyone at GCHQ and in every one of the Five Eyes rooms where the you know, top secret clearance kind of dominates, I think everyone was probably completely freaking out. I can imagine. I can imagine. So I, I take it then that this guy, he had no other problems prior to that. Like, did anybody, once his name came up, were people like, oh, of course it's him. You know, we've, we've wondered about him. Any, any indicators, you know, ahead of time or this was this totally out of the blue? <sighs> 
So, so I, I talked to a number of people who worked with him in academia, who dealt with him when he joined the RCMP, who dealt with him, people who worked in other intelligence services, who inter, you know, intersected with him occasionally. And the consensus of the guy is that he was incredibly hardworking, incredibly studious, intelligent, confident, but not too confident, didn't have any radical politics or any really any politics to speak of, you know, maybe squishy sort of liberal, but you know, nothing that would cause anyone to remark on, didn't seem to have a pension for gambling, didn't seem to have a, a drinking or drugs problem, you know, didn't seem to have money troubles, lived quite frugally by all accounts, seemed pretty happy in his job, all things considered. Maybe he was a bit of a workaholic, but it didn't, you know, that was his own fault. I don't think he had any sort of grievances against people. I think the consensus of the guy is that maybe he was a little prickly, maybe he was a little grumpy. But, you know, when you're talking about insider threats, you tend to look at people who have, you know, big red flags, right? Lots of debt, affiliation to 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 radical politics, got passed over for a big promotion, had really butted heads with someone in the service, you know, blame someone for their for their demotion, right? You tend to look at kind of big emotions, big feelings, big problems, big dollar signs. Mm -hmm. And he just didn't have any of it, right? I think the consensus is that he was a bit of a blank canvas. Like no one knew him particularly well that I could figure out. There was another woman who worked in the the general security kind of world whom he rented a basement flat from. And I didn't speak to her directly, but I, I know others who did. And and even see, she seemed to you know, not have any strong opinions about the guy. Every day you're under attack, whether you realize it or not. Your digital devices contain your entire life, your finances, your conversations with friends and family, your interests, and even your movements. And all of that is vulnerable to an ever-expanding class of criminals, scam artists, hackers, and even governments. You don't want to leave your data security entirely in the hands of your ISP or anyone else for that matter. It's up to you to protect yourself using a multi-layered defense strategy. Silent offers you the protection you need to keep your data and devices secure from wireless threats. Their multi-shield technology blocks cellular signals, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, EMP, RFID, NFC, and more. Silence lineup includes everything from signal blocking wallets all the way up to 40 cubic liter Faraday duffel bags. When you're geared up with Silent, you'll be truly disconnected, undetectable, untraceable, and unhackable. And you can now use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to save 10% off your order from Silent. Find them at slnt.com. That's slnt.com. He just did not seem like the type to do this. And I, you know, I spent a fair bit of time going back and reading some of his academic works and like they're good he's smart but they're not brilliant right mm -hmm. um it became very clear that he was really interested by the role technology plays in terms of enabling organized crime and also by the way enabling insider threats to the security system mm -hmm. um but he didn't actually have a good grasp of technology is the funny bit you know i talked mm -hmm. to somebody who did some of the work on one of his projects who basically did a lot of the coding a lot of the technological work that underpinned his research but he basically said like you know cameron ordos couldn't do a lot more than maybe a couple a couple line uh, commands in in terminal like he, he just didn't have a grasp of the, of the actual tech that, that sort of existed here. So, you know, going through all of this, I, I was working on the story and I, I just really couldn't figure out what drove this guy. And it's still kind of a mystery to me, to be honest. We got a little bit of this detail through the court case, but I don't, I'm not even sure that he knows why he did it at this point. It is such an interesting conundrum as to what he thought he was trying to accomplish here. And we can get into some more of the specifics of that in a second, but it just suffice it to say, I don't know that we need to create a whole new archetype of the insider threat just to deal with Cameron Ortis, but 
I, he just he kind of lives in this liminal space where you know if you go through the, the main the main drivers lust greed disgruntlement politics ideology or or you, you know general espionage allegiance to a foreign power I think that's roughly the five he doesn't fit in any of them he really and even if you look at the people he he was trying to leak to it is such a mess yeah there, there, there's Vincent Ramos and Phantom Secure yeah but then we find out that he had also sent documentation to uh, a money laundering network that had ties to, amongst others, Hezbollah, and that at the time of his arrest, he was planning on leaking information to the Chinese government. You know, mm -hmm. how do you delineate any sort of ideology or purpose behind that? Drug traffickers, terrorist financiers, and the Chinese government. What a mess. Like, what a complete mess. Yeah, just this guy's such a total nightmare for counterintelligence people. Because, like you said, there's no indicators. There's nothing to work off of ahead of time. So, and then you say, you know, there's five types. So, is type six the person that has no indicators at all? You know, we can't. <laughs> you know what I mean? How do you like control for that. Yeah. So, yeah, just people are going to run themselves ragged for that. But it is a really fascinating case. And I know that you wrote this article in, I think it was April 2021, and and more has happened since then. You know, with the, the court case and everything. So there have been some developments, but even still, it's very opaque. The whole situation, in some ways, isn't it? Yeah, so you know, I'll tell you, his defense at trial was very interesting, and there was a there was definitely there was a moment where I considered this while working on the original story, and there was a moment where I had to revisit it during his trial and just revisit the possibility that it could be true. But his defense was that he was basically running an unsanctioned operation to try and catch these criminals using his own cunning and skill. Right. So his plan. And so we know now that his approach to these individuals, you know, what, what, he, what he did. And, and this is and again, this should probably speak to how a how little technological expertise he had, but also b how bad the RCMP OPSEC was. He went to the office on the weekends and overnight. He printed off the classified documents on mass. He went home and scanned them, or I think took photos of them, had to Google how to remove the metadata from PDF files. <laughs> he had a, a, a post-it note on his computer explaining how to do it properly. Oh my gosh. He removed the metadata from his PDF files and then would kind of crop off the header and the footer, which would be the identifying information about kind of where some of this originated. And he reached out through an anonymous email account to Vincent Ramos, to an interlocutor for this, for this Hezbollah financier. And he was going to, I think, reach out to someone from the Chinese embassy and basically presented himself as a hacker who had gotten access to these classified files and was willing to sell them for a price. <laughs> he, he apparently asked for about $20,000 from Vincent Ramos, but the RCMP said there was never any evidence that he actually got the money. And to be honest with you, I don't think there's much evidence that he actually needed or wanted the money. I think he asked for it just to make it seem to, to kind of bolster the idea hmm. that he was a hacker. And so he, he kind of made this approach. And I think he sent them a sample of this. And then I think, you know, I think it's still somewhat unclear the degree to which they actually struck up that, uh, that arrangement, but basically tried to make this relationship seem like he was just a random hacker who had managed to access the RCMP's internal systems. In his telling, or at least his defense attorney's telling, he did all of this in order to ingratiate himself with Ramos and the others, and that he would use that relationship to ferret out information from them that would help take them or some of their clients down. And it's enticing as a theory, it's enticing as a justification until you start looking at literally any aspect of this, because there's just zero that makes sense here, right? Mm -hmm. First off, you know, I, I think anyone in the intelligence world will tell you, you can't, you can't just go off selling top secret information on your own, like a cowboy and think you're going to get anything worthwhile out of it. The risks are much, <laughs> much, much greater than the reward. I think anyone will tell you that if you're printing off documents at the dead of night and taking them home to scrub the metadata from, you're probably not <laughs> working on a, you know, a genuine op. You're probably, you know, you're doing something right, shady. Right, right. And then finally, you know, the, the he, he must have also known 
that the state of the investigation was already closing in on Vincent Ramos. So the idea that he would go and leak information to someone that the RCMP and the FBI already had a pretty good chance of arresting is just so completely insane that it just doesn't connect. The justification is just completely meritless. Maybe he was having a psychotic break and genuinely believed that he was you know, you know, doing some James Bond-esque solo operation that mm-hmm. would net him a bunch of criminals and terror financiers and, and spies. But you put this on paper and it makes no, it just completely falls apart. Yeah. Especially when it comes to the Chinese. You can't give the Chinese classified intelligence and expect anything in return that's going to weigh the same in terms of value. It's just completely nuts. Mm-hmm. So if I recall from what I read anyway, he did not actually make contact with them but he was planning too soon is that yeah correct when yeah with arrested? the chinese yeah okay. that's right that's right yeah didn't he have like he was a very like a fastidious note taker or something like that and he had a note about plan for first contact or prepare for first contact or something like that in his to-do list yeah that's exactly it and i think he had a <laughs> folder on his it's the folder where he put a lot of his scanned pdfs was called batman <laughs> which I guess he thought that would throw them off. But the, the folder where he had the information where he actually had scanned the business cards of a couple of Chinese diplomats, he put that in a folder mm. called First Meeting, uh, which okay, again, okay. stupid. Uh, yeah. the, the guy is not the most technologically advanced guy in the world. But again, this showcases just how bad the internal security of the RCMP is, right? You know, I was talking to some folks in other parts of the intelligence world and they were telling me, you know, they were leaning in, we were like, oh, I think we we're sitting over beers. And and one of them says, you know, I, I don't understand how he could have got this information out of what was probably a skiff or at the very least a highly classified arm of the RCMP headquarters because, you know, we log everything. Not only do we log who accesses the files, we also log who's printing off what, right? Our networked printers are going to throw up a red flag if somebody is in at you know, <coughs> one in the morning mass printing off classified documents. Right. That's, that's just I, I what understand. I was thinking. Yeah. And, and, and I, I said, well, that's a good point. I'll have to think about that as I wonder how he did this. I wonder how I wonder how he got around all of these systems. I wonder how clever how he must be so clever. Nope. It turns out the RCMP just has such archaic and terrible security that they didn't notice, which oh, is wow. just so embarrassing. I mean, I, I, I think the, the exact number is it's 440 some odd documents he had in his possession. The fact that he was printing off hun- literally hundreds of documents from this internal system, I think it was maybe over a year, year and a half period. The fact that he was printing off that many documents and no one noticed, no one cared. The fact that he wasn't, his bag wasn't searched before he left. The fact that no one was, was keeping track of the fact that he was accessing all of these files late at night on the weekends. That, is, that bodes really badly for your ability to catch insider threats if you're not doing that, which is really basic stuff. Yeah, what a head scratcher. It's really bizarre stuff, no question. So they were logging the printer usage and then nobody was like checking the printer logs or something like that, I guess it would come down to something simple. they weren't logging it. Like, oh I, I mean, you know, the one thing I was told from, from a number of people that the RCMP is sort of a weak link. I, I, it wouldn't surprise me to learn that maybe the New Zealand and Australian intelligence services might also have some, some equally weak parts of this whole chain, though admittedly sort of the Americans, apparently, in terms of <laughs> what people yeah. can access, what contractors and reservists can access on some other basis. But it's been true for a long time that the RCMP just are not as good at both intelligence work, on espionage work, on security work. They just do not have the skill sets. It's part of the reason why Cameron Ordis was brought in. He was supposed to bolster their ability to do all of this, which is the grand irony here. <laughs> mm-hmm. The RCMP spent many, many years out in the cold, forbidden from doing national security and intelligence work because they had committed so many, in some cases, felonies in the name of national security in the 60s and 70s. They basically had that that authority cut off and transferred to a new service, which is the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, roughly translates to the Canadian version of the CIA. Mm -hmm. The RCMP was kind of forbidden from doing this work for decades. It wasn't until 9-11 They had that mandate kind of returned to them to some degree, but they've also bungled numerous, numerous cases since then, leading to to one Syrian man being renditioned and tortured on on bad intel. They've 
done at least at least one terrorism investigation, counterterrorism investigation that probably entrapped a mentally ill drug addicted couple into trying to blow up a legislature building, you know, on, on I, I think probably pretty flimsy grounds. So the RCMP is not good at this, uh, right? Mm. Karen Ordis was supposed to help them get better at it. And he ended up taking advantage of how bad they were to undermine the entire intelligence sharing partnership. So it is just, it's it's sort of failures all the way down. It's sort of screw ups all the way down. A lot of yoke on our face. And literally the only saving grace for Canada here is the fact that Everybody else has had such bad screw ups over the last number of years that no one can make too much of a fuss about us, <laughs> right? I mean, that is our only sort of saving grace here. And it's not good. Uh, and I mean, it's clearly a sign that we need to step our game up and improve internal security, expand our expertise, start to own our position as one of the one of five members of the world's most exclusive intelligence partnership, mm-hmm. or else we're going to lose it. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see how that would trigger some very serious reforms that were way overdue, certainly, but at least they're happening now. So Justin, besides that one specific document, did he definitely leak anything else or was he planning all of the other activities um, that we no, talked about? I, I... But pretty confident he managed to get uh, some of these files in the hands of this Hezbollah financier okay. who, you know, I, it's not entirely, I, I think every, almost everyone in that, in that operation was arrested a number of years ago. So, so clearly didn't, didn't jeopardize that entire investigation. In the original indictment, they list four names uh, of individuals who he's directly communicated with. One was Ramos, uh, two were tied to that financier network. And I, I, the fourth, I know I haven't, I haven't learned who that is. May have been revealed at trial, but 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 I think it was just the four. And then ultimately, he tried to approach the the Chinese embassy at Wells as well. So so kind of three main uh, clients. But I think it's pretty clear that he didn't intend on stopping here. If he seemed pretty confident that wasn't, he wasn't going to get caught because he's getting even riskier in his approaches. I can only imagine he had a list of others that he was hoping to approach mm-hmm. in the near future. Yeah, I mean, well, in in some ways, he was right to be confident because he clearly got away with it for what do you say, eighteen months or something like that. I mean, yeah. and nobody was the wiser about it. So, but yeah, that that's crazy to send a document that can so easily be traced back to you to a known criminal, not only a known criminal, but one that you already know is under investigation because that's what you're sending him. So, you know, it seems very plausible that law enforcement would get their hands on that document, which is exactly what happened. I, I do have to imagine, and the one the one sort of rationale. I could keep coming back. I kept coming back to for Ortis was that he was he had such a dim opinion of the service he worked for that he figured he'd never get caught, which is maybe the most damning of all possibilities here. I mean, if he was so sure that the RCMP would never catch him, but also would never catch Ramos, and it was just incapable of sussing out a mole in its midst. And therefore, there was no real <coughs> consequence to the thing he was doing. That may have enabled, you know, his his insane risk taking. But mm-hmm. and 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 you know, it's also quite damning the fact that the RCMP didn't catch him. The FBI did really. I mean, they they handed the evidence to the RCMP on a silver platter, who were you know caught totally flat footed here. It's pretty bad. I mean, he 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 he, he knew exactly the capacity of his own service. And he was unfortunately right. Yeah. But I have to imagine that meeting between the FBI and, and Mount of Police liaisons, just how tense that must have, must have been the after effects walking out with that document that this is one of your people and we found it, not you. It's got to be extremely concerning, extremely embarrassing. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> My gosh. So the trial just ended pretty recently, and I know he was found guilty. What was it he was found guilty of? Was it espionage or some other specific charge? Yeah, it's it's sort of a wonky charge under the it's a, it's an espionage related charge around kind of the mishandling and then the handing over of classified information. Some of the other charges were dropped specifically, and this is where it gets quite legally complicated. But it was basically decided that in order for him to mount a full defense he'd have to have access to the classified information he was charged with sharing and that there was just no way to to have a trial 
that uses this level of classified intelligence without compromising said intelligence. So it became this sort of catch-22, and ultimately they decided just not to pursue the charges. And regardless, he'll, he'll be in prison for quite some time. And when he's out, the chances of him getting a hold of classified intelligence is next to none. So I think kind of it's justice done here. But it, it does show how difficult this can be in a civilian justice system, right? You know, how do you prosecute somebody for the sharing, the stealing and sharing of classified intelligence if they can't reference that intelligence and the utilization of it in open court or even in closed court in some circumstances. It's pretty tricky. Right. Yes. Weren't some of the sessions they were closed, right? Like people still, the you know, journalists still don't know what transpired during those specific sessions of his trial. Is that right? Yeah, that, that, that's right. I know some, I, I didn't attend the trial myself, but I, I, I know many colleagues who did. And there was sort of a constant dance of get up, go in the courtroom, watch five minutes, judge kicks you out again, get up, go wait outside, oh, wow. get ushered back in, back and forth, back and forth. It's it's a tough case to cover. But my colleagues, it's a very, very, you know, the, the national security journalism community in Canada is not huge. And those are my colleagues who who did Kat Tani with the CBC, Jim Bronskill with the Canadian Press. There's some really great journalists who covered this trial. Alex Boulier, the Toronto Star, did some great coverage, despite the kind of constant need to keep some stuff secret, to keep some stuff held till after the trial. Uh, to constantly kind of be booted in and out of the courtroom. I see. I see. So <clears throat> were there any consequences for anyone else in the organization? You know, you said that he had a very close relationship with the with the head of the organization for some time. But did, they have, did he have to resign or anything like that? No, he'd already retired at that point. So mm -hmm. he was already gone. But no, it, it really genuinely seems like he he was kind of solely responsible for this. Again, I think the failures are institutional more than, than personal. But there was, there was shocking little consequence. You, you said a minute ago that some of the reforms are already taking place to fix this problem. But I'm actually not sure that they are. <laughs> and that's the kind of funny thing. Canada can be a really slow moving country in a bunch of ways. We have this kind of a big bureaucracy, a big kind of government apparatus that can be really slow to adapt even after a crisis. You know, I was talking to people in the sort of intelligence world and they were, they were sort of bemoaning the state of the RCMP, which lives in this nether world between policing and intelligence. And they're just they just don't have the 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 mechanisms in place to to you know to 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 justify the intelligence they're getting in some cases. So if you're at C, you know CSIS, you know the, our answer to the CIA is a pretty professional organization, right? You know you don't see a lot of leaks coming out of CSIS. You know they're, they've not always had the most sterling record, but at the very least you can you can look at them and sort of with some confidence say. This is an organization that, that, that belongs in the Five Eyes. And for many uh, members of CSIS, I think for almost everybody who really receives above a secret clearance, you're looking at, I think in some cases, it's, it's a polygraph test every year. I think in some cases, there's a five-year requirement. Mm. And I'm extremely skeptical of the benefits of polygraphs. But what it really is, is a really, really good way to redo your clearance, right? To go back mm -hmm. and ask about any money troubles, ask about any relationship troubles, ask about any memberships in, in dangerous criminal organizations, right? It gives you the excuse to go back and ask a bunch of questions and to cross-reference against any available evidence, any you know derogatory indicators you might have about that, about that employee. And it just keeps you alive to the threat that there could be insider threats, right? Right, right. The RCMP doesn't do that. The RCMP, by and large, does not investigate its own. They actually tend to be very protective of their own. There is certainly, CSIS actually comes in to do the initial security clearance, but as I understand it, they don't often, unless there's reason to, go back and, and, and double, double check their members. They don't kind of redo that clearance. The polygraphs come in pretty infrequently. I still don't think there's, a, there's an appetite to change that. And until you do stuff like this, the really kind of bare bones stuff to, to deal with these insider threats, I mean, you're going to keep getting them. Yeah, that's no question about it at this point. They, they keep coming. I, I feel like I'm never going to run out of stories to tell here, honestly, because <laughs> they keep happening over and over again. No question about it. But his is yeah. so interesting because so many of the factors that are normally present are not present there. And it's just a total head scratcher. And I wonder if he'll ever truly come clean about any of this. Do you think perhaps that he was was like a, a debriefing maybe part of his trial or, or could that be something offered during or, or before sentencing? That does happen sometimes, but I'm curious if that has with him. It, it, it's also entirely possible that we'll never get a full accounting of why he did it. Right. Maybe internally it's known and we just won't know publicly. Yeah. So I, I do have to imagine that there's some level of 
reputational protection that's going into this. I know that there was an interview that was conducted after his arrest where I gather he was pretty blunt about, I, I think he he made clear that he wasn't super happy in his job in the RCMP. I think he made pretty clear that he knew there'd be intense consequences for what he did. But I don't think, I, I never, I've never seen anything that amounts to a justification or an explanation. Maybe he gave it and we're just never going to get to know what it is. Uh, but yeah, I remain curious. I mean, I, I, I you know, the, the, the sort of Occam's razor explanation that I keep coming to is, you know, he sort of did it because he could. You know, maybe he told himself that he wanted the money. Maybe he told himself that he was going to ferret out useful information from his contacts. Um, you know, I, I've also kind of toyed around with the possibility that he actually had a personal relationship with Vincent Ramos. They actually both grew up in British Columbia in the suburbs of Vancouver, hmm. not too far from each other. I could never find any evidence that it was the case. I never find a shred of evidence, but they're around the same age, uh, probably similar socioeconomic status. You know, it's possible. That could be it. And that could have led to the, 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 the subsequent leaks just after he got away with the first one. But again, I don't think it matters much. Like, I'm really curious. Like, I'll, I'll forever be curious to know the full story of that. But I don't think it matters at the end of the day, right? I mean, there was, a, there was another, there was a, a naval captain in here in Canada, uh, Jeffrey DeLeslie, I think his name was, who had worked on some of the, some of our, submarine our submarine program the late 90s early 2000s so i remember correctly he one day you know he was in the middle of his divorce with his wife i think he had caught her cheating he was distraught he was angry and he ended up selling a bunch of these submarine secrets to the russians and when he was interrogated he sort of broke down and he, he said yeah i did it for the money but really i did it because i was just angry and, you know i just did it because i was just just frustrated and my life sucked and yeah did i want a hundred grand absolutely but i really was just pissed off and to some degree you know i thought that was interesting because i would classify him as someone who's doing it for money but he wasn't really doing it for the money he was just doing it because he had secrets and he could sell them and make himself powerful and make himself mm -hmm. important and make himself feel clever and secretive and like a spy and to me, you know, that is probably a more real explanation. But also, it doesn't matter why. What matters is that he did it. Right, right. I think I've seen that video, and it's so rare to yeah. see a, a confession like that on a national security case. So that yeah. was extremely interesting to see. I was surprised that was published. I was published, that, but I was very grateful that I had the chance to see it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a really fascinating case. Good example of, of, of someone getting caught, I think, also pretty early in the process before he managed to, to actually exfiltrate much Mm -hmm. much important intelligence. Yeah, yeah. One wonders what could have happened if this had gone on any longer than it did. But I guess we'll never know. So many things about this case we'll never know, just like a lot of the cases I cover here, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, ex that's exactly right. And I mean, <laughs> part of this is that I think sometimes we pat ourselves on the back after we catch one. But it's, you know, there's probably at any given moment. And actually, <laughs> one, of, one of Ortis's academic works was looking into the sort of evolving nature of insider threats. And he basically just pointed out that with the proliferation of digital systems, insider threats just become instantaneously or steadily more easy to do for the insiders, hard to detect for the institutions, and in infinitely more consequential for those who would actually receive the intelligence. And you know, you, you may have caught one, but there's probably a pretty good chance you got at least two more somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. two, three, one, who knows how many in your ranks somewhere, just because it is so much more possible. And the, the diversity of those who want this information has grown exponentially. And because it's just one of those things that's impossible to entirely prevent or entirely catch or entirely stop. And I, you know, I think the the leaks that went out on Discord are a great example, or the constant posting of a classified military kit on that what is it, Warhammer? Uh, yeah, back here. War Thunder forums or something War, like that has become a running joke at this point. Yeah. I think, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, so it's, it's amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and you know, it's there's there's technical means that could have prevented or uncovered what Ortis was doing. But, you know, like we said over and over again, there's really no way to predict somebody acting like him fits that profile, predicting when they'll decide to take action like that. So there's, there's really nothing they can do. I mean, sure, we can have an alert when somebody prints late at night or something like that. But there's there's no clear you know catalyst for him turning and, and deciding to take on these actions. And 
So they they essentially just got lucky this time around. It seems like the, there's a part of his master's thesis, and and, and I should say Cameron Nordis was an interesting academic. He was by no means the best. And he had a real penchant for sort of convoluted metaphors. At one point, he's describing the sort of cat and mouse game that was playing out. And this was probably 1999, I think, when he wrote this. this he's describing this sort of cat and mouse game that was emerging with respect to organized crime threats online, particularly in East Asia, describing how a lot of these criminals were increasingly using chat rooms and web forms and, and text messaging to communicate and to organize even as police were sort of working in, in, in you know, dial-up technology or pre-internet technology. And he describes this cat and mouse game, but then sort of says, well, sometimes technology can lead the mouse to becoming the cat. And it, it goes on hmm. for pages in a, in a way that is completely convoluted. But it's so funny that he was completely alive. And he was describing the problems that would ultimately lead to his successful espionage and to his eventual arrest, right? You know, he wound up using a mix of old school and new school tech uh, that evaded his capture, including <clears throat> by selling to a company that was using advanced technology to evade police capture, mm -hmm. and that he was ultimately caught using very old school techniques. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a really fascinating example of, of, of just how complicated modern policing and security intelligence has gotten, but also how just thinking about how to upgrade your tech in a couple of really kind of simple ways can protect you and, and put you at least kind of a couple steps ahead and or at least close the gap in, in a pretty major way. Right, right. I agree totally. What a fascinating case. This one has really, really piqued my interest in a big way. So I'm very grateful that I had the chance to talk to you about it, Justin. So for those of you who want to read the article, you can find it online. I, I think it's in several different places, but the article title is The Rise and Fall of a Double Agent. It's a fascinating read. It's a lot shorter than a lot of the, the books that I normally cover here. So you can read it you know, in a single sitting if you want to and provides a, a lot of great detail about the case and just very, very interesting stuff. So Justin, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, what are you working thank, on thank right now, by the way? Yeah, so, so, so that story was published through The Walrus, uh, which is a great Canadian publication, um, long-form journalism and storytelling, which I'm very fond of. If you're Canadian, give it a subscribe. Um, but, you know, now I'm, I'm kind of working on diversity of stuff. Um, you know, I've been covering a lot of aspects of the Ukraine war for the last uh, almost going on two, more than two years now. Um, I write a, a Substack newsletter called Bug-Eyed and Shameless, which I'm very fond of. I do once a week or so. And I'm working on a second book that should be due out, I don't know, eventually <laughs> on, you know, it's just the trouble of writing books. You never quite know when they're going to be done, but it's on the sort of history and, and the problems endemic in crowd control and riot policing, which I am, I'll be excited to read once it's done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a very interesting topic. I look forward to that too. So you think maybe like next year or something like that? I mean, can you even put it in that kind of a, a ballpark? I mean, last year, I hoped it would be this year, ah. the year before that. So we'll, we'll see when it gets done. Understand completely. Understand completely. Great. So Substack, you said, is there anywhere else that people can connect with you online if they want to learn more? Do you have a Twitter profile or anything like that that you want to share? I used to have a Twitter profile that I've abandoned because it's become a horrible cesspit of, <laughs> of Nazis and complete bug-eyed nut, nut jobs. But I'm on, I'm on Blue Sky. I'm on Mastodon. I'm on, I'm on the smaller alternatives if you want to find me there. Okay, fantastic. I'm a big fan of Substack myself, so I'll look you up right after this, as a matter of fact. Beautiful. Well, Thanks thank you so me. much. Absolutely, Justin. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Cheers. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.